Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, um, Bart. And I would like to thank Sam for inviting me to speak in this um, very nice special session and Tobias also for the um, very interesting talk that preceded this one. Um, so as Tobias mentioned, I have a different approach to something I call um, synthetic probability theory. Actually, I'm not going to talk directly about that today. Um, if anyone's interested, I gave a talk on that last year at a workshop um, called something like Category, Categorical Probability Theory and Statistics. That was the workshop and my talk is online. So um, you're welcome to have a look at that. Um, but today I want to talk about something which is related, but is more general, um, which is essentially about uh, identifying and exploiting logical reasoning principles, um, logical principles for talking about probabilistic concepts. And in particular, I'm going to look at, um, oops, I need to get my slides paging. In particular, I'm going to look at um, two main probabilistic concepts. Um, first, I call equivalence, which if we say that two random variables are equivalent, well, by that, I just mean the, the relation of them being identically distributed, having the same probability law, and the very important relation in probability theory of um, independence, say, between random variables, so x and y being two independent random variables, or more generally, uh, a closely related but uh, more powerful notion of two random variables x and y being conditionally independent given a conditioning random variable z. So these concepts together, um, as anyone who knows a little bit of probability theory will know, play um, that they all these concepts play very important roles in probability theory. Uh, so a very simple property, for example, one can state just by um, conjoining together the first two properties is state that two random variables are independent and identically distributed, um, which is known as the IID property of probability. So we're going to be looking at um, logical principles for reasoning with these concepts. But at the same time, we're going to be doing something more general, um, which is we're going to also look at non-probabilistic interpretations of the same primitives. So the, uh, the concepts concepts of independence and conditional independence and um, equivalence arise in other contexts too and share the same logical principles. And in fact, I'm going to have quite a long introduction, starting with a non-probabilistic interpretation, which is a sort of non-deterministic notion of um, non non-deterministic notion of independence, conditional independence, and equivalence. And um, I'm going to do this to, we're going to approach the logic we're going to get the reasoning from a, what's been a reasonably active topic in logic over the last um, 15 years or so, which is the um, field of dependence logics or, and the, or independence logics. There are various logics of this flavor, um, but started in a, in a program of the, the set theorist Yoko Venen, um, who wrote a book on these sorts of logics in 2007. So he um, developed something he called dependent logic. And uh, this was then later adapted by Eric Gradel with, with Yoko to um, something called independence logic. So this dependence logic, as its name suggests, is a logic for talking about dependence. Independence logic is a logic for talking about independence. Um, and the original versions of these logics were based on a, uh, an interesting form of semantics called team semantics, which has later been generalized to something called multi-team semantics. So I'm going to 
tiny bit introduce you to this area. Um, I'm not going to assume that people know much about, about these logics. Um, I'm going to tiny bit introduce you from maybe a, a slightly different perspective, which is the one that's going to be um, relevant to my talk. Um, and we're going to, to look at these, this independence logic as essentially as originally developed as a logic for expressing, well, the independence logic as a logic for expressing properties of um, what I'll call non-deterministic independence, which is kind of essentially the notion of independence that arises in database theory um, in other names. Um, so we're going to be generalizing, the idea of dependence and independence logic is one generalizes ordinary first order logic so that in as well as the usual logical vocabulary, one has new atomic formulas that um, talk about, for example, independence, conditional independence, and well, they, they often have a subset rather than equivalence, but I'm going to focus on something I'll call equivalence, which I'll introduce, introduce in a moment. Um, I'd like, and it basically builds on ordinary first order logic. So in ordinary first order logic, we are interpreting formulas in structures. So curly A is a structure here with an underlying set A. And um, you have, of course, the, the, the semantics of the logic is defined by defining the satisfaction relation for formulas when a, when a structure satisfies a formula. And the formula may, of course, have some free variables in it. So when a structure satisfies a formula given an assignment or environment, as they're often called, um, an assignment that assigns um, elements of the structure to um, variables of the formula. So, of course, this is just the first lecture in, in the logic course, the semantics of first order logic. Um, but dependence logic and independence logic were then developed from that by via the observation that if one generalizes having a satisfaction relation that talks of, from looking at a satisfaction relation that talks about a single assignment to a satisfaction relation that talks about a whole set of assignments all simultaneously, then one has a canonical interpretation of, well, I'll talk about equivalence in a moment, but of a dependence atomic formula, which I'm not going to mention further in this talk, and independence and conditional independence atomic formulas. So just this, um, just this generalization from going from talking one assignment at a time, as in ordinary first order logic, to talking about a, a set of assignments, or slightly differently, slightly more generally, a multi-set of assignments allows one to introduce in a canonical way atomic formulas for dependence and independence. So these sets of assignments, these were first introduced by Wilfred Hodges um, when he was looking at the, the kind of independence-friendly logics, as they're called, of, of Hintiker, um, that Joko Venon saw that these could be um, recast as a way of um, interpreting dependence and independence atomic formulas. Um, so Hodges looked at sets of, of assignments and these have subsequently been generalized to multi-sets. So we're going to go with multi-sets and we're going to look at it from a slightly different point of view. So um, in the terminology of independence logic um, and dependence and independence logic, a multi-team is a multi-set of assignments. So an assignment is mapping variables to elements of the structure, um, where, the, where every assignment in the, in the multi-set has the same finite set of variables underneath it. So we can think if it's a multi-set of assignments, so we've got the set of assignments here, the functions from the set of variables that we're looking at, to the underlying set of the structure. And a multi-set can of course be, rather than presented directly as a multi-set, one can present it um, as a function from some 
where we think of the multiset as the image of this function. So omega is like a, a set of elements um, or a set of worlds, if we like, and each assignment is given by applying this function to a world. So I've got a little picture somewhere. Uh, if I can go to the right thing. Right, so here's an e example of how one might look at a, a set of assignments. So I think of omega as a set of sort of possible worlds we might live in. And to each element of omega, we give it an assignment to the variables. So the, the kind of world I live in, I want to go walking in the mountains um, at the weekends, but I don't, I don't want to get wet. So I want to go walking in the mountains when it's a, a nice sunny day. Um, so X is the variable in the possible worlds that I encounter in, in my life. And um, as we see that the possible worlds I encounter is either it's sunny, but unfortunately when it's sunny, it's a weekday or it's raining. Um, and when it rains, it might be a weekday or it might be a weekend. But these, these are the kind of possible worlds available to me. Um, but uh, you see here that we've, that we've got a multi-set of, of assignments. In fact, it's that nothing occurs more than once here, but we might have another point here that maps to the same assignment. And then, then you see how it's a multi-set. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. Uh, so a multi-team, that's a multi-set of assignments, could be represented like that. But of course, we could just, um, this is simply a, a bit of currying involved here. So we could simply put the functions in the other order. Um, so we could also view it as a, a, as a multi-team as an assignment from the variables and rather than to each variable mapping it to an element of the structure we map each variable to a function from the set of possible worlds to the structure so just a trivial mathematical rejigging of the configuration and i'm going to look at multi-teams in this way and uh, I guess just the notation can is probably suggestive to at least some of you that um, so I'm thinking of omega as a kind of set of possible worlds here we can we can think of it as a like a, a sample set of all possible non-deterministic places we can be in and then by analogy with the definition of a random variable we can view a function from this sample set to um, the underlying set of the structure as a non-deterministic element of A. So there are no probabilities involved at this stage, at this stage, but we have a, no, a multi-set of possible outcomes of A. So viewing that, we can view a multi-team as simply an assignment of non-deterministic elements to variables. And then the semantics of um, of independence logic that studied by um, Venon and, 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 and Gradel can be recast in a, in a very perspective, in a very um, perspicuous way, where we're going to define the meaning of a formula. So we have a formula with some, with some free variables, and we're going to define the meaning relative to our set of possible worlds. And so the, the meaning of a formula is interpreted in an environment that assigns non-deterministic um, elements to variables. And um, here is the interpretation of the atomic formulas that I'm going to consider in the logic. So um, we'll have strict equality. And that's just if the non-deterministic variable of x at omega, so the non-deterministic variable is a function from omega to, to a, if it's the same function as, the, uh, as that assigned to y. 
Um, but more interesting are the notions of independence, um, conditional independence and equivalence. So by equivalence here of two non-deterministic variables, I just mean they have the same set of possible outcomes, of possible values. So the environment here maps the variable to um, a function from the possible world to A, and the possible outcomes are just the image of that function. And so we just ask that the two functions, the two um, non-deterministic elements given as functions have the same image. And then we say that those, those two non-deterministic variables are equivalent. Independence is a bit more complicated. So let's go back to the picture. So here, looking at our example, um, we see that if we know that it's sunny, that X is sunny, then in this particular multi-team, we know that it's a weekday because that's the only possibility for, for sun. So getting the information that X is sunny gives us information about the variable Y. So this says that X and Y are not independent. So in this case, we have that X whoops, is not independent. So let's cross that out is not independent from y. Being independent would mean for any value of x, for any possible value of x, and for any possible value of y, there would be some world in which we could find both those two possible values together. So if we go back to the slides, that's what this says. I'm using, I haven't defined it formally on the slides, but, uh, but it basically says what I just said. So if A is a possible value for X, and if B, so diamond means is a possible value here, and B is a possible value for Y, then simultaneously A and B, this simultaneously means in the same world, A and B are both possible values for, uh, are simultaneous possible values for X and Y. And maybe let's skip over conditional independence, except to say, I won't, I won't read the formula out, but I, Except to say, what it says is that if we know of, if we know a particular any particular value of z, then if we learn a value for y, we don't in doing so that, that knowing the value for y on top of the value for z does not give us any additional information about the value of x. So this is how the multi teams give. I, what seems to me like a pretty canonical semantics to independence and conditional independence formulas and to equivalents. Um, and on top of that, we can interpret the first order logical connectives. So conjunction is just what you think it would be. So phi and psi hold if both phi and psi hold. Whereas existential quantification has a much trickier um, semantic definition, which is written out as a formula here, but let me explain that to you as a picture. And just to say here, I've, what I've written here is um, translating the, what's called the lax semantics of existential quantification that occurs in independence logic. I've, I've basically translated that definition into this formulation of multi-teams you, that I'm talking about this, this formulation that's using um, non what I'm calling non-deterministic variables. So let's look at the existential quantification. So let's go to the picture here. So what I want to talk about is from this world, um, I want to look at some situation which would allow us to say, well, actually the reason I wanted to go into the mountains at the weekend on a nice sunny day was to observe a total solar eclipse. So I needed it to be a nice sunny day and I wanted to go to the mountains to get the nice clear air. So I'm going to have a, another variable, um, Z, which is going to talk about whether or not on this day there is a total eclipse of the sun. 
So here we've got the same model we had before with these three points. Um, and in fact, in the universe I live in, the, the possible worlds that we have, where they're not kind enough to give me sunshine on the weekend. Um, but the whether or not eclipse occurs is completely independent of whether the of what the weather is and whether it's um, uh, whether it's a, a weekday or not. So there are um, some days for each of these three possibilities on which there's an eclipse and some days on which there's no eclipse. So the point is working in this particular um, multi-team here, which is an assignment, the way we're looking at it is a, um, a, a mapping from variables to non, so the variable X gets mapped to the um, non-deterministic element that either has sun, rain, or rain. So these three possibilities don't have enough distinctions in them to be able to say um, there exists a there exists a non-deterministic element Z um, that uh, can be an eclipse on the weekend and can also be eclipse on on a weekday. And so the exist so I want this to be true, and the semantics of the existential quantifier allows us to add some more possibilities by um, expanding our sample set of non-deterministic possibilities here. We're adding some more possibilities on some of which there is an eclipse and on some of which there is no eclipse. So we still get the original information, the red worlds get mapped to the red world here. So on both these red worlds, it's sunny on a weekday, both these green worlds, it's raining on a weekday and so on. So we, so we get back the original information via this surjective function here, but the surjective function allows us to expand our view of the world only through the lens of these two observations to a more refined picture where we have different worlds that correspond to them. And we're viewing those through um, here, whether or not there is an eclipse on this world. So in this case, this model above, satisfies that there exists a non-deterministic variable that can be an eclipse on a weekday and can be an eclipse, um, sorry, on a weekend and can be an eclipse on a weekday. And because the eclipse and the no eclipse happens, well, independently of the values of the other variables, in this case, we do have that the, val the variable Z is independent of the joint the tuple, the pair of variables X and Y, the, the, the joint values of X and Y. So for any value of possible value of Z and for any possible pair of values for X and Y, then there exists a world that gives us the resulting triple of values. Okay, so that's existential quantification. Let's go back to... Um, so conjunction and existential quantification. And um, if, we, if we had a classical logic, of course, we're dealing with some funny forcing semantics here. It's not quite clear what the logic is, but if we were to have a classical logic, then we could just define negation as, well, phi doesn't hold if and only if, I mean, it's a triviality, one would think, if and only if it's not the case that phi holds. Now here, this is the first place that I'm departing from um, the independence logic of Venon and Gradle. In those, in there, in the in the independence logic literature, they tend not to have a, a a full negation. They only define negation on atomic formulas, and they don't give this definition. They give a different definition of negation. So. I'm giving the naive definition of negation. And with that, this is justified by the following theorem, which is, we'll say a sentence is, is forced if it holds for, um, so it's a sentence, so it doesn't have any interpretation, you don't have any variables to interpret, and we might as well then consider the singleton set of worlds, there's nothing to map it. To. There's, um, there are no 
uh, non-deterministic elements over that set of worlds to, to have. Um, so it's false, a sentence is false if it holds in this world, in which case it holds in all worlds under all assignments. And in fact, it's a theorem from these definitions that um, every theorem of classical first order logic is forced. So with this simple definition of negation, um, we actually get a classical logic for expressing properties of independence, conditionally independence and equivalence together. Um, and I don't think this observation is made in the literature on dependence and independence logic. So they rather consider other connected. They have different, def different approach to negation, as I said, they have various approaches to various different accounts of um, disjunction, only one of which coincides with the disjunction one gets through um, defining it using de Morgan's law from the definitions I've given. Um, they have a different semantics of universal quantification from the one one gets by, by defining it as not exists not. Um, so they, there are lots of interesting connections in the standard independence logic. They have these fun, fancy connectives, if you like, some in, uh, different universal quantification, different disjunction from the ones I get. They, um, there are lots of connections with complexity theory that, that come up, and that, that's a lot of the work focuses on that. Um, but they do not validate classical logic, so they don't get back. And I mean, one thing their logic, the, the independence logic is usually construed seems a bit weak on is that I don't think it's very suited to reasoning with these concepts. So for example, under their semantics of universal quantification, the formula, the sentence for all X, for all Y, X is independent from Y is validated. So you, um, it's sort of hard to combine that with interesting reason, natural reasoning about, about independence, I think, um, first order reasoning. So instead, by making this uh, sort of naive definition of negation, it turns out that we get classical logic and we're not going to have such um, issues as this. Um, we're going to have a, an interesting first order logic of these principles. So where does this theorem come from? I'm not going to talk about the proof. And actually it comes from um, a category theoretic um, way of looking at this. Um, so actually underlying what's going on here is a category of these sample sets. So the sample sets are um, non-empty sets, is the, the category of non-empty sets. And the, in the existential quantification, we wanted to expand the possibilities for worlds we were looking at um, with the current view of worlds by um, having sort of more worlds. We had that surjective function from omega prime to omega. So surjective functions play an important role. So in fact, the category is the category of non-empty sets and surjective functions. And then to any omega, we're looking at the, the set of functions from omega to a, so a to the power of omega, if you like, um, as the non-deterministic variables over value set, uh, over um, sample set omega. Uh, and so the omegas are the objects of the category of non-empty sets and subjective functions here. And so what we're really using, we, the, um, the, the actual definition of existential quantification uses the fact that we've got um, that this forms a pre-sheave. Um, so it's, it's obviously contravariant because we've got the um, the sample set here in the exponent, and we get a we get a appreciate that's a contravariant function from the category of subjections to set. And not only that, the definitions on the previous slide of equivalence and independence. So here I've put a, a double. I've made it a double perpendicular because this is now the semantic notion of independence. These define sub pre-sheaves and also conditional independence. But actually more than that, this category has a property called in Peter Johnston's writings, the left or a condition, which basically just says that if you have a co-span, that's a pair of arrows into the um, 
into the same code domain, then you can complete that co span to a commuting square. And whenever you have a category with that property, it carries a, a particular growth and lick topology. That's um, machinery you, that one uses to define um, sheaths in the sense of growth, growth and lick. I'm not going to go into the category theoretic details here, but anyway, subject, the category of subjective sets enjoys this property. So it carries the atomic growth and lick topology. And actually, these pre-sheaves of non-deterministic variables, so to which each sample set omega assign the non-deterministic variables valued in A from sample set omega, are a sheaf with respect to the atomic topology. And in fact, these sub-pre-sheaves are not just pre-sheaves, they are sub-sheaves. And what that means, without, I'm not going to dwell more on the category theory, but just what it means at a high level is that we can use the internal logic of the category of sheaves. It's a slight issue because this is a large category, but let's we'll ignore size conditions here. It's not really a, a significant issue. Um, we can use the internal logic of the category of sheaves to talk about independence, conditional independence, and equivalence. And that corresponds to the semantics that we got from um, independence logic, it's exactly the same thing with the negation we've given. Okay, so that's enough about non-deterministic um, elements. There's a probabilistic analog of this, which is that um, we change the category. So the category of surjective functions we're viewing as a category of sort of sample sets. And the whole formulation of a non-deterministic variable is a function, a non-deterministic element is a function from a sample set to a value space is designed to be quite similar to uh, random, random variables. So we're going to change the category to a, a nice category of sample spaces. So sample spaces of, in probability theory is a probability space with a probability measure. We make it needs to be a nice probability space for our approach to work. So let's make it standard Borel. And um, instead of surjective functions, we're going to consider the, the measure preserving measurable functions. Then everything else happens much as before. We have a, a pre sheaf, which is also a sheaf with respect to the atomic topology of random variables over the sample space omega, where for it to be a sheaf, we have to identify random variables up to almost sure equality, but um, or almost everywhere equality, um, but that's a, a nice identification in many ways. One wants, that's, that's an important equality between random variables. And once again, now, now we have that um, identity, uh, 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 equivalence of distribution, independence and conditional independence, where these are the probabilistic relations are again sub-sheaves. So this allows us to um, basically use the, once again, the internal logic of sheaves to get a, log a classical logic because the logic in atomic toposes is always classical. And it's basically the logical definitions are exactly the same as I gave before. And we can now reinterpret um, equivalence as equivalence in um, distribution and independence and conditional independence as, um, as the stochastic versions. Right, so it's almost time to wrap up. I, I did start um, five minutes late. At, as, I'm going a bit slower than, than I planned. So what I wanted to do then was show you what one gets from, the, um, from this semantics for um, random variables. So one gets the expected axioms for the equivalence relation, which I haven't put on the slides, and for conditional independence. These are all standard, but there are two very interesting principles that arise that are particular to this sheaf world and um, apply to the non-deterministic situation, to the probabilistic situation, and to uh, 
other incarnations of the same approach um, as well. So the first one is the independence principle that says for any Y and Z, we can always find a fresh copy of Y that's got the same law as it, that's equivalent to it, a fresh copy X of Y that's independent from Z. And the more general version that talks about um, conditional independence. So there always exists fresh, there always exists fresh randomness and one can get that fresh randomness to conform to any law one knows about through an existing variable that's one, that one's got. And using that, one can um, give a very slick proof of the existence of, um, of IID, that's independent identically distributed sequences, which I won't talk over. The other very important principle is what I call the invariance principle, which says that equivalence sort of acts like, acts like equality in that it satisfies a substitution law as long as the formula you're talking about, the only free variable is the X that you're substituting. So, um, so in a sense, it's the logic cannot express properties that are not invariant under probabilistic equivalence. Now that's not quite true because for example, it contains equality, which is equality of random variables, which is certainly not invariant under probabilistic equivalence. But in order to express something that's not invariant under probabilistic equivalence, one needs to make use of some additional free variables. So as long as one has a sentence, then you can only express properties that are in de that are, depend only on the law, the probability law of a random variable. And again, there's a more general one for joint distribution. So I'm really going to rush through. So I had an application of this to prove that probability that independence is preserved by functions and not just by functions, by existential properties. So if you've got an if you've got a, a variable X that's independent from Z and you can show that from X some other some other variable y exists, then you can find such a y independent of z. And also to derive what's called the transfer theorem in Kellenberg's book on foundations of probability theory, which says that if we've got an x prime, um, if you've got two equivalent random variables, then you can, and you've got a, some other that render variable y that enjoys some distribution with respect to x, then you can find an analogous random variable by y prime that such that x prime and y prime together enjoy the same joint distribution as x and y together. So I'm sorry, I'm really rushing over these things at the end. Um, it's uh, the important part is that the invariance principle and the independence principle are, the, are what give us these results. Um, so to summarize, so what I presented is uh, what I think is a, a judicious reformulation of this particular semantics of independence logic, focusing, whereas if one focuses just on conjunction and existential quantification and combine it with the naive negation, it turns out one gets classical logic and, and uh, indeed this is the internal logic of, of sheaf toposes, atomic sheaf toposes. I've given examples, non-deterministic elements, so independence and non-determinism, um, random variables, so independence in um, probability theory. Another example is um, nominal sets, which I didn't have time to um, include in, in the talk. And I particularly want to mention this independence principle and the invariance principle, these two properties, because I think these are very interesting axioms. And uh, I gave a few applications, but um, well, I rushed over them, but uh, I, I expect there are other applications too to be found. Just to mention a little bit about uh, related work. So uh, this is one approach to reasoning about probability. So another one would be the approach that, um, that Tobias was talking about. So based on Markov categories. And there's another one that appeared recently in Lix this year with a, a paper about uh, 
a bunched logic, which is more about a more logical approach, like this talk rather than a category. This is a category, Markov category is a category theoretic approach to, re to reasoning with string diagrams. I've been more talking about a logical approach. Bunch logic is also like a logical approach to reasoning about independence. And um, we're using, as you see, bunch logic rather than ordinary classical logic. In fact, is a bunch intuitionistic logic in that paper. Anyway, I better stop now because even allowing for the start five minutes late, I've reached the end of time. So uh, thank you very much.